this was not an ordinary event. This was the biggest event ever to take place on these shores. It was Wimbledon in Dublin, I suppose. I was amazed that somebody that young could possibly be involved. Sean Collins, who is he? He's confident. You know, I think a lot of people think he's arrogant. I wouldn't go as far as say arrogant, but I think he looked like a man in charge of his destiny. He's got huge ambition, very entrepreneurial. Enigmatic. A gregarious character. A bit of a loner. Evasive. Someone who likes to be in control. And just very, very naive. Sometimes life is such that somebody like him can pull off something like this. It can be done. In this instance, it wasn't. Dublin 4. More than just a postcode, it's a byword for money and privilege. And it's where a 22-year-old with no experience of event management conceived of one of the most ambitious events Ireland has ever seen to unite the biggest names in tennis, fashion and music. He risked and almost lost everything in the process. His name was Sean Collins McCarthy. Sean was very much a product of a newly moneyed Ireland. He grew up on Dublin's leafy Aylesbury Road and his local school was St. Michael's College where he rubbed shoulders with the sons of the very wealthy and would make contacts that would come in useful later in his life. As a teenager, Sean showed promise on the tennis court, enough promise to attract praise and encouragement from coaches. He set out to become a professional tennis player. But he needed serious training. He couldn't quite make the grade for a scholarship at Nick Boliteri's prestigious tennis academy in Florida, but his parents determined to send him there anyway. It's very, very expensive. You're getting top class tuition from top coaches. A few make it, and most don't. In the boot camp atmosphere of the academy, which produced Andre Agassi and Pete Sampras, among others, Army veteran Nick Boliteri instilled in his students a work ethic built on self-belief and success. I don't want to be around a loser. I don't mind being around a loser. They gave 110% of themselves. How can you be discouraged with a person like that? After he left Boliteri, Sean's tennis career lasted just three years and his performance on the men's satellite tour ensured Sean Collins McCarthy would never rank among the annals of the tennis greats. His CV shows that he did compete in a number of world-ranking points events at that time, but not with, a, well, not with any great deal of success. But Sean brought more than one set of skills back to Ireland with him. Somewhere along the line, he'd become a world-class networker, and this, rather than tennis, would be the mainstay of his future career. Sean returned to live in Dublin sometime in 2000 and became a regular visitor to the exclusive Riverview Tennis Club in Klonski, where he met another figure who would play a central part in his career, tennis coach Uli Nganga. At the time we were playing uh, tennis at Riverview um, and we became friends pretty quickly. I think one evening we, we decided to go out for a drink, so we popped out to Ashton's in Klonski and had a pint of Guinness. And Sean came up with this idea that wouldn't it be great if Dublin had a world ranking tournament? Over drinks, Sean took Uli into his confidence. He told him of his plan to use their tennis contacts to stage a major tournament in Dublin. I think it was something Sean had been thinking about for some time. Um, and I just think he, he was glad to run it by someone who, who wouldn't maybe just completely laugh at the idea or, or blow it out of the water. As the evening wore on, the idea grew. Sean would bring the world's top 10 female tennis players to Dublin. There would be a fashion show with big name supermodels and a rock concert with an A-list headliner. Fashion, tennis, rock and roll, the trilogy was born. I thought it was a great idea, I thought it was fantastic. At that stage, even if we failed, we're still having a blast, you know, seeing if we could do it. And is it possible? The first step in this hugely ambitious plan was to set up a company called Propriety with Uli and a friend from Sean's school days, Kieran Duggan. They may have lacked experience, but they weren't short on big ideas. In April, Sean sent Uli to Charleston, Virginia. There, he pitched the idea to Sean's mentor from the Florida days, Fritz Now, a top coach and one of the most influential people in US tennis. 
Fritz opened the door to the sports management agency IMG. Sean's business plan was simple. He would get the top players in the sport on board at all costs. Everything else could be sorted out later. We started actually getting quotes for players who would be interested in doing it. Um, and to be honest, I think one of the first who came on board was Serena. You know, you don't get a much better endorsement as such than the number one player in the world. You know, as with all these things, it's like a travelling circus, so the word soon gets round. Once we had Serena showing an interest, it was a lot easier to, not just with the tennis, but to get people from the fashion world interested. Annabelle Croft, Britain's number one tennis player at the age of 21, and now a successful TV presenter, came on board early in 2001. I was actually asked to be the European team captain. So you had Zena Garrison, who was also on the tour when I was playing, being the American team captain, and I was the European team captain. Having secured the team captains in the autumn of that year at the US Open in New York, Sean made contact with the best connected Irishman in world tennis, John Dolan, who would help to provide the final bit of star power Sean needed to complete his lineup. Jen? Can I talk to you for one minute yeah. to get some quotes? I was doing my day-to-day -day job there and I happened to run into an Irish guy outside the women's locker room by the name of Sean Collins and uh, he was saying in a very excitable, enthusiastic way that uh, you know this, this, this event was going to happen and uh, needed our help in securing some of the player interviews and, and it was top secret. That was the first time I, I met Sean. Sean's dream team was starting to come together. His negotiations with IMG secured the participation of the Williams sisters, then Jennifer Capriati, and eventually even Anna Kornikova signed on the dotted line. But bringing them on board for this untried event meant very substantial money needed to be offered to their agents. And I think the figure was 1.6 million for all of the players to come, with the Williams getting 500 grand, and that was well above the odds. Sean needed financial backing, and for this he looked closer to home. His first stop, friend and business partner, Kieran Duggan. The largest Irish investor was Ray Duggan, father of Kieran Duggan, who was involved in organising the event with Sean Collins. Uh, Ray Duggan would have invested about 600,000 through a company called Barrancas, and he also invested about 300,000 euro himself personally in the event. But this wasn't enough. Once again, Sean tapped into his circle of contacts. Norman Euston, who's brother of Bono, the lead singer of U2, have invested about 300,000 euro in the event, and it's thought that Houston's daughter was a close friend of Sean Collins, and that's why the, that's the reason for the investment. Uli Nganga knew there was a lot at stake financially, but he didn't have time to worry about it. I was aware that we didn't have sponsors and that we did have investors, but I still don't even know who the investors were. We had such a lot going on from all angles. You get on with what you're supposed to be doing, and that's what everybody did. With eight months to go, Sean set about ensuring his investors would get a return. And so he put the TV broadcast rights up for sale through Greg Roselli, a London-based agent whose business is selling sports and music events to TV companies for big bucks. I think we're approached in about April. And at that point in time, we said you, it was too late to get sponsors. It had to be a sponsorship-driven event. There was no way broadcasters are going to pay for this event. Prime terrestrial broadcasters are not going to buy and pay money for this event because it's not an established event. This wasn't going to be as easy as it looked, but Greg had a plan. Give the TV rights to Sky Sports for a nominal amount and get free ad space in return. Sean could sell this onto the sponsors, if he had sponsors. One man who knows more about tennis sponsorship than most is Des Allen of Tennis Ireland. I know the business people in Ireland who have an interest in tennis. I know my own sponsors very well. I would have been happy to support a pitch to some of these people in the sense that what Sean was trying to do was potentially so good for Irish tennis. I can't say I could have delivered a sponsor by no means, but certainly I could have maybe worked in some small way in terms of directing these guys towards the best sources. Who knows? It's, 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 it's history now. The opportunity wasn't there at the time, so. Tennis Ireland wasn't asked to help and no sponsor came forward. Sean continued to work on bringing the trilogy to fruition, but until he had all the financials pinned down, he was careful to keep them very, very quiet. The tennis community is fairly small in Ireland, and these things, if they are happening, would be known certainly a year in advance, and there would be a big build-up to it, and maybe Tennis Ireland would be involved in it, and the whole tennis community would have been involved in it. But it, it just seemed to happen very, very quickly. Sean's strategy had always been to keep a very low profile, until the last minute. 
We didn't want everybody to sort of know about it because there were organizations far bigger than us who could just say, hmm, that's a good idea, thanks. When Sean eventually did go public, it wasn't just the established players in event management who were taken by surprise. At his first press conference in October, the reaction from the Irish media was bafflement. These young guys weren't even on the radar. They seemed to have no track record, and this was a huge event, and so they looked for the catch. The discussion in the office at the time was, how is he going to get them over? Who's going to fund it? How did he convince them to actually come to Dublin, which isn't renowned for its tennis? The thing that I found most amazing was that this wasn't IMG, this wasn't Octagon, this wasn't Showbiz Inc. It was Sean McCarthy and a couple of his friends. People are doubting this is actually going to come off. I think there are rumours that the players weren't even going to show up, things like that, and that obviously didn't help anything. And the head producer at Sky was nervous up to the very last second. We didn't sign and close off on the contracts for broadcast until two or three weeks prior to the event. That's how nervous Sky was. No sponsor had yet come forward. No music act had signed and ticket sales were slow. But the RDS was booked for December and the show must go on. Alan Gannon's company, Frontline Security, was hired to provide close protection for the players and models when they landed in Dublin. No small task in a post-9-11 world. Sean Collins came into us a couple of months before this event was going to happen. He told us he'd been involved in tennis for the past five or six years. He'd been in Florida. He'd worked at the top level. I looked at this guy, 23 years old, and he was just brimming full of confidence. Now, I've been in this business for a long, long time. I know how the business works. I know that the business is structured in such a way that it's pretty much run by two or three large organisations. And for somebody to start off on their own would be impossible. But to do this huge fashion show and then the concert and then the tennis event over two days. And he has all the details and he has all the names. And he's super confident. There's not one tiny element of doubt in his mind. And by the end of the meeting, no doubt, element of doubt in anybody else's mind that this thing is going to happen. But it seemed there was still one significant group who doubted whether it would happen. The public were proving reluctant to fork out for tickets to an event that they hardly knew was happening. Posters went up, but was it too late to turn things around? I know how I'd feel if I was sort of walking through Buddhist town and saw a big poster saying, oh, Tyra Banks, Anna Kornikova, uh, top ten players in the world, they're going to be here playing tennis at the RDS. RDS? They haven't got tennis courts. Was, you know, I'd have been sceptical. What do you do if no one believes you're actually doing the event? Well, you have to get the players to actually say, we're coming to Dublin, all right? <laughs> Which is basically what we did. Hi, I'm Anna Kornikova, and you'll see me at Dublin this December for the Trilogy event. I think it's special if in any way you can help kids, especially Chernobyl kids. The Chernobyl Children's Project had agreed to lend its name to the Trilogy in exchange for a portion of the profits from both the fashion and music events. The charity had been promised up to half the proceeds, a deal that could have been worth one and a half million euro. With the charitable cause, cash-rich backers and the biggest names in tennis signed up. It looked like this was going to be a good Christmas for everyone involved in the trilogy. You better watch out, you better not cry, better not pout, I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. Without any doubt, this was Christmas paid for on a huge scale. Nobody had to worry about how the credit card bills were going to be paid this December because here's the golden egg that's going to pay for it at all. To town. But just when things seemed to be going precisely according to plan, they started to fall apart. It was only when the people started asking tougher questions about the amounts of money that were going to charity, the people started disbelieving his motives. Welcome back. We were talking about the trilogy. We have Sean Collins on the line now, who's the managing director and who's the man behind this. Sean, good afternoon to you. Yes. The charity, first of all, has no liabilities whatsoever. Uh, well, did they drop their appearance fee because it's for Chernobyl? Um, the, the tennis players? Yeah. I, 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 I really rather not say, but... When I hand uh, over I, my 90 euro or whatever, what percentage of that is going to the Chernobyl Children's Project? We have an agreement with Chernobyl. Mm. Now, it's a very perplexing agreement, but what I can say is... Why is it perplexing? 
Well, it is. Wonderful. Well, oh, you yeah. say it's a perplexing agreement. I'm asking. Well, I'm, it is, it, it, I'm, it, it, I'm all in favour of complex agreements. I'm not in favour of perplexing no, agreements. Obviously, this but agreement no, but, between Chernobyl but, uh, is I, far too perplexing. I really, for the public I, but I really, I really, would, I really would like the of public. The ninety to euro to buy a ticket. What percentage of that goes to the children of Chernobyl? And well, you I've say it could possibly be zero. No, I've answered these questions, Joe. I mean, we're we're. We're, 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 we're on a different path completely now. I mean, I mean, we're really laboring this point right now. We're really laboring it. Mm-hmm. And I've, 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 you know, I've tried to explain it as best I can. And it's not, it's not my fault if you personally can't okay. understand this. Okay, I take that point as well, yeah. mate. Eileen, the more he spoke about it, the more evasive he was, the bigger the hole he was digging for himself. The hole was about to get deeper still. It emerged that Sean had decided to name the trilogy trophy after himself. We discovered that the event was going to be the, the Collins Cup. Sean definitely did not want it called the Collins Cup, and I, you know, I kind of feel guilty. I think I wish we hadn't sort of talked him into it. People started thinking he had an ego problem. But then, as time went on, we discovered, well, there is no Collins Cup, because there is no Sean Collins. I always knew Sean Sean McCarthy. There was obviously some reason he had himself to change his name. At that point then, the stories began to circulate that there was uh, a connection with Michael Collins in the background. It's a good story and it certainly lent some showbiz, I suppose, and a touch of politics to the whole venture. Based on the information that I've been able to access in terms of his uh, professional career, I'm not sure that uh, commemorating it with a, with a trophy would have been all that appropriate. Sean may not have won many trophies, but his tennis ability did earn him notoriety. A baller is a term that we would use for somebody who could really play. And then guys who couldn't play so well would be got bluffers, so I would have heard him called Bluffy McBlufferson, but that's, that's part of the game, and I'm sure Sean would appreciate that. With one week to go, there was still no sign of the promised A-list music act to headline the closing concert. Negotiations with Paul McCartney and the Corps had broken down. The trilogy was about to become a rather less catchy duology. The original concept of the trilogy was to bring the biggest stars in tennis, fashion and music to Dublin. With only one week to go and a third of the tickets sold to date, organisers said that in recent weeks it became apparent that a music act of the same standard would not be attainable and therefore the concert would not go ahead. And suddenly bang, that's cut practically overnight. We're told at Friday about four o'clock in the afternoon, the concert's not on. It is unfortunate that we don't have the A-list act this year, but um, you know we've got to focus on what we have, and that's you know Anna Cornico and the Sisters. But the long-established players in the entertainment industry in Ireland had a firmer grip than Sean realised. No music act seemed willing to sign up with him as a first-time promoter. Having seen some of the stuff that was going on and heard it, I thought, hmm, you know, it's, it's almost like you actually really want this to fail. He had no music act, no sponsor, and his five-day event had just become three. But the self-belief instilled in Sean at Bolletieri didn't let him down. And luckily, his investors still had faith in him too. They stumped up more than €500,000, bringing their total investment to over €1.5 million. Euro. Sean's father also invested €150,000 of his life savings. The trilogy was about to become a reality. In December 2002, the RDS was a hive of activity. John Heffernan, contracted to provide rigging services, noticed one or two things out of the ordinary. One of the things that struck me, there was no branding whatsoever. And you know, I do quite quite a lot of events and shows and they're always driven by branding. And as a contractor on it, I'm kind of concerned with really the job that I'm doing in particular, not how the company are managing it. That's not really my concern. Bums and seats don't pay the bills at these events. Anybody looking at this from a professional or even outside view would say, why wasn't there a major sponsor on board? The day before the fashion event, when I went in to have a look around at the stadium, why are the signs? Where are the sponsors? Where's the logos? There's none. Nothing. And it was at that point I knew that this thing just couldn't support itself. And it was then that I knew my own heart and soul. That was it. We weren't going to get paid for this gig. The cracks began to appear at that stage. And yet still, still, this great circus that was rolling along with the ringmaster waving to the crowds, 
Still, it rolled along with everybody cheering. The first few days of December 2002 and the arrivals hall at Dublin Airport is teeming with celebrities here to appear in Trilogy, the first international tennis and fashion event that Dublin had ever seen. It wasn't until players and models started actually landing at Dublin Airport that the press suddenly said, oh, it is happening. Because before then, I don't know, they, I think they thought that it was just some massive poster spoof or something. You know, it, it, it wasn't taken as something real. Behind the scenes, cracks were appearing. But if organiser Sean Collins McCarthy felt the pressure, he wasn't letting it show. He was still hoping a last-minute sponsor could be found to cover the costs of this huge event. Sean went out and bought himself a great big coat. And he got into that coat and he just his head came out looking out over the top. And he stayed, he didn't take it off. They did a lot of kind of walking around in the shade and the shadows, but you never really knew <laughs> what was going on. One thing that definitely went on was the fashion show. On the 4th of December in the RDS, the world's biggest supermodels and tennis stars took to the catwalk in aid of charity. Anna has donated her fee to the Chernobyl Children Project, so Anna, thank you for that. Anna's fee, and even the charity's involvement, would later be the subject of controversy. But the spectacular nature of the event silenced its critics for the moment. Everything was done on an absolutely, humongously grand scale. And it definitely felt incredibly glamorous to be a part of it. But that kind of glamour came at a price. Sean had initially booked four bodyguards to look after his stars. By the time the event began, he'd hired 16. Initially, we have a budget of 20,000. More people, more hours. More hours, more people. The answer is yes, over and over and over again. Finally, the budget hits 40 grand plus. We kept on asking questions. The models, oh yeah, everybody we need security there. Tennis players, yeah, probably two for this person and maybe three for that person. The airport to the hotel, oh yeah, another bodyguard there. The hotel, definitely need people in the hotel. On and on and on. We ran out of people. Over the next three days, 20 of the world's greatest female tennis players would compete in the RDS. It was USA versus Europe, all played out to the sounds of Irish rock and roll. I've got certain memories that were good and they weren't supposed to be. For instance, when the first match came out, I think it was Anna Kournikova was playing against Monica Seles. We had this fantastic idea, right? Let's have the European players coming out to you two. Beautiful day. How appropriate. We'll have the Americans coming out to Born in the USA. We thought, this is going to be great. Celes came out first, who was playing for USA. Of course, the fellow who was on the tape button just puts on YouTube, Beautiful Day. So right from the start, that screwed up our entire plan for the whole, the whole exhibition. So, of course, someone had to go over to him and say, just Beautiful Day again for the next... And so that then became, for every single person who came out, we had that song going. Sean would later say more than half the tickets were sold by the opening night and that over 15,000 people turned up. I think it's great that the idea came about and that people put some money behind it and, and are trying to make it happen. The trilogy was shown in 100 million homes around the world, an audience which should have earned over 1.6 million euro in TV rights and ad sales. I had uh, a lot of fun. It's a really great place. I hope you know I'm going to come back soon. Wednesday, that looked like, oh, watch out for that wasp. There's a lot of wildlife here in Ireland. But for some of the celebrities, Dublin's wildlife wasn't its only attraction. Serena was very interested in looking around Ireland. She, if we'd let her, she'd have, you know, gone on her own around the whole place. But Sean's orders were clear. Whatever they wanted, they got. Serena Williams visited England many, many times and she'd seen the fish and chip shops. And she'd never eaten fish and chips. And Noel, my man that was with her, said, well, would you like to visit a fish and chip shop? She said, yeah, great, terrific. She was fascinated with Leo Burdock's fish and chips. She couldn't understand why people were eating out of paper bags. She hopped out of the car and went and got her chips, which I'd, I'd love to have been there to see that, to be honest. <laughs> The 
The US team won seven games to one and were presented by the Taoiseach Bertie Ahern with the Collins Cup. It was obviously fantastic to have Prime Minister there, which was unexpected. I, mean, I didn't know he was coming until that day. From a tennis point of view, it looked extremely successful. I think the players were happy and everyone left with a good feeling in their, in their hearts and minds. The trilogy was over and the stars were partying the night away in an exclusive Dublin nightclub. But as the sums were added up, the real story began to unfold. We finally all went to Reynards on the final night of the affair. Anna Kornikova came in, she was dancing on the floor. And everybody's amazed, isn't this, isn't this absolutely wonderful, you know? Sure, I'm happy it was. Sean came in, he had his coat, shuffled off to the corner, had a couple of drinks. Sean must have been a worried man. Box office takings came to half a million euro, roughly one-fifth of the three million he'd been banking on. A dubious media and the collapse of the music event meant the paying public stayed away. The RDS had been full to capacity, but many of those attending did so with cheap or free tickets. No sponsor had been found to carry the dead weight. But if Sean didn't seem concerned, he was the only one. Bully was beginning to feel the strain. He was tense. We were all tense. It was a big event. You'd have to sort of ask him whether he felt he'd, he'd got in too deep. I don't know. Whether or not he took on too much. You're, you're going into territory now that's more sort of financial. I, I can't comment on it because I don't... That wasn't my, my thing, unfortunately. At one point, he appeared to be very anxious and went over and said, Lou, are you OK? Everything all right? You know, and then he said, I'm worried about this. This doesn't seem to be right, and that doesn't seem to be right. And it was quite obvious that he was being left in the dark about a lot of things. I knew we didn't have a sponsor, but it was very much a case of, your job is to make the show go OK, look all right, coordinate people, do that. I, I wasn't in a position to start questioning things that, quite rightly, people would have turned around to me and said, what are you worrying about? That? That's not your... Just do your job. I'm sitting in a room full of ex-legionnaires, commandos, ranger wing, and they're all sitting there, and I turned around to one of the guys and I said, I don't think I'm going to get paid. And he kind of looked around the room and he said, who the hell is not going to pay us? The full extent of the financial disaster that was Trilogy now became apparent. The television rights and sponsorship had been expected to fetch 1.6 million euro. Instead, the rights made just under 14,000 pounds. And since the cost of the broadcast came to more than 15,000 pounds, Getting the event on TV actually left propriety management around 1,500 out of pocket. And there were a lot of people who had worked hard and were now looking to get paid. When the question of his management of the event later came before the High Court, Sean said it was a mystery, not only to him, but to the executives of IMG and all his many investors, that the event was not a financial success. I think at the end of the day, the public were concerned that it wasn't actually going to take place even while it was happening and they didn't come. 15,000 people did attend the events, but even if everybody had paid, it still wouldn't have added up. When was the time that Collins McCarthy noticed there was a problem? When did they see that a project was going to go down the toilet? Was that the day the doors opened? Was it the day the project finished? Or was it a few weeks before the project started? Certainly, I believe that it was before the project started. And at that point, it was still time to call it off and everybody not to lose their shirts on it. If the tickets to the tennis event and to the fashion show had been 500 euros each, it still couldn't have paid for it. So, in the end, what was the bill for Sean's three days and nights of glory? I have absolutely no idea how much money was lost, but I would imagine it was in the region of millions. Something of the order of uh, 3.6 million is the deficit figure, and I think the assets of the company are 5,000 5, euro or something of that order. If it's at a million euro, it would make sense. How you lost three million euro, I have no idea. I mean, how much did they play, pay the tennis players? You know, the fees that were being banded about that these top players were getting were astronomical. The figure was 1.6 million for all of the players to come. And that's essentially why they were in Dublin. There's no other reason. But there was no money left to pay many of the small Irish businesses. So many people thought, we're going to get our money for Christmas from this. As it transpired, it was a very, very lean Christmas for a lot of people. And a lot of people suffered as a result, make no mistake about that. Uli and Ganga had worked longer and harder than most, and the trilogy had been as much his dream as Sean's. But the end, when it came, 
was abrupt. I did intend originally to stay in Dublin for Christmas, but I spoke to Pat and Sean and they said, no, go back to the UK, um, have a Christmas break. Looking at it now, in retrospect, that must have been when the bad press started. And so I don't think a lot of people were answering calls. I don't think it was, it was malicious. It just became very apparent that get on with it, get another job, and, um, and, and get on with your life. With nothing in the kitty to pay the bills, the only possible next step was to put Sean's company into liquidation. And with that in mind, a meeting with all the contractors was arranged for early 2003. He agrees to meet us here in the RDS. And at this stage, we know the game is up because the Four Seasons have put him into liquidation and there's no money. And the father and son came in and they were both quite hostile, it has to be said. And we're all sitting there and the guy said, well, Sean, what about all this money we've lost? What about the money you've lost? What about the money I've lost? And I think they assumed that as contractors, we were investors in their project, which is not the case. Never once did he say, look, I really screwed up. It didn't happen. And I apologize. Quite the contrary. Total, absolute, abject arrogance all the way through. In an affidavit to the High Court, Sean later said he was baffled by what happened, that he greatly regretted that people lost out as a result of the failure to realize the anticipated pre- and post-event income. He said that even with the benefit of hindsight, he didn't understand how the trilogy did not attract sufficient interest from sponsors, TV companies and the Irish public. Let me tell you, there's big, powerful men out there that control this business. So you just can't walk in and take it over. You've got to have a long-term strategy. It was supposed to be a, a long-term thing that would, that would go on and on. And, you know, we, we had a lot of uh, ideas to take it further. His plan to make Trilogy an annual event had failed spectacularly. Sean was now facing certain legal action for reckless trading. In this country, we now have the uh, Corporate Enforcement Agency. I contacted them and asked them to look into it. With his company being wound up and faced with the threat of further legal action by the Director of Corporate Enforcement, Sean sought top advice from liquidation lawyer Rod Enser. Sean contacted us when they presumably had decided that they were going to look at going into liquidation. Now the liquidator recommended that a restriction proceedings be taken. Restrictions proceedings are basically where if they're successful a company director will be restricted from being a company director for five years on the back of their, the way they handled their company. Given that Sean is 22 years of age and uh, presumably has ambitions to be directors of companies in the future, obviously that would have been quite restrictive on him. It would have gone to court then where the, the liquidator, uh, Dublin accountant Tom Cavanagh, would have taken the case in the High Court against Collins. I didn't think that that action would be successful. I mean, the guy's a young guy, you know, all he used to do is say, ah, I'm a young guy, I screwed up, and no judge is going to penalise him for that. Cavanagh felt that the event shouldn't have gone ahead because of the low ticket sales and because of the fact that they hadn't sold television rights immediately prior to the event. And he felt that this was reckless and the event should have been cancelled. My submissions to the court in relation to that were that, on the other hand, there were revenues that would have come in if the event went ahead. So the court accepted, on the basis of the submissions, that it was more likely that the creditors were going to do better as a result of the event proceeding rather than closing it down a week in advance of the event itself. In some cases that didn't occur and of course you'd feel very sorry for those creditors who, where that didn't happen. The judge's verdict was that Sean Collins was innocent of any recklessness in his business dealings. The judge took a decision that entrepreneurs like Sean Collins take risks in business. And given that there were risks in business, he was right to take them. Um, and he felt that this was just a, f a legitimate business failure. I think if you want to learn your trade, there's a Smurf at business school, there's false courses and things like that. And I'm not here to provide money for him to learn his trade from. The case went to court, nobody asked us anything about it. None of us were interviewed, none of us were called, no, no information was taken off us. Effectively, the debts of his company, Collins McCarthy Promotions, have been written off. They're gone. There's nothing to worry about now. He can continue in business again in Ireland. I'm astounded. Absolutely astounded. If that's not reckless trading, 
well, what the hell is? Well, there's a list uh, published today yes. and it says Norman Euston, Bono's brother, lost yes. out over one yes. million. Bill O'Hurley, PR, lost 100,000. Four yes. Seasons Hotel, 34,000. Mick Devine, the uh, driver, 10,000. Ticketmaster, 22,000. Among the smaller creditors that were owed money were the Donnybrook Lawn Tennis Club, Fifth Avenue Food Company, Irish Rigging Services. I think it was in around five grand or something like that, you know. I mean, at this point, it's kind of, it's faded. It's, 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 it's ancient history, you know. Paul Butler Cleaning, which was owed money as well. Reynards, one of the nightclubs in Dublin, was owed money. Frontline security. Just over £40,000, which is a hell of a lot of money to any company to lose. Uli Nganga's two years' work on Trilogy netted him about €9,000. I did feel very, very bad for people, even though, you know, I was one of them. I definitely haven't had the full, full, full fee, and I don't think I ever got my airfare. <laughs> I came out of it with nothing. I know everyone else did. No doubt there is sympathy on both sides, always, in any liquidation. And it's, I think, fair to say that no one wins in a liquidation situation. Don't get the impression that we're all living in the Cayman Islands. It's genuinely come out different to how I think everyone thought it would. But he stood up and he's faced his critics. I haven't seen Sean come out and face the critics. Nobody has. We haven't seen Sean at all. He disappeared off the face of the earth from that day to this. Three years on, Sean has left the country. I would say he's keeping his head down now. The International Tennis Federation knows who he is. They would know his past, and I would think he would find it very difficult to stage something like this again. Look, it was his first time. He could go on to being Greatest promoter Ireland's ever seen. Who knows? With a new name. I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that this guy is going to turn up again somewhere. He's going to do the whole thing all over again. And there's going to be some guy like me, only with an American accent, or a French accent, or a British accent, sitting in front of a TV crew a couple of years from now in the same circumstances as I am today. I have good memories of Sean and I say memories I mean we're still every now and then chat um, and yeah he's a, he's a nice bunch of guys <laughs> the dream is over the money spent and the trilogy a distant memory to everyone involved or is it could trilogy 2 the sequel be coming soon to a stage near you well, my understanding would be that he's um, looking at business opportunities over in the States and what they involve, I'm afraid I can't say. Funnily enough, when I was commentating in Dubai last year, my co-commentator said to me, do you know anything about Sean Collins and uh, this sort of European-American event? And I said, I can't believe you just said that. I said, what do you know about that then? I said, because that was an event I was involved with that I never got paid on, because that's the first thing that comes into my head. And he said, oh, well, I've been asked to be the European team captain for an event they're doing in Miami. I was like, what? <laughs> Would you be surprised if I told you he was doing it again? Doing the trilogy? No, I wouldn't at all. I wouldn't. That would... That would actually be part of the course. Oh, my God. And when is this going to take place? Not this December. I'm not sure when. He's going to try to do the trilogy again. You want to know something? The sign of an entrepreneur is that he walks down an alley, gets beat up 12 times, he's got courage enough to walk down that 13th alley. That's the difference. That's the sign of a winner. Maybe I'll buy a couple of tickets and go and take a look at it. Talk to a few people involved. That'd be a very, very interesting scenario. Would you work with him again? Uh, yeah, I'll work with anybody. I'll work with the devil if he's got a good deal. Go ahead, Noreen. You were at the fashion show. When we arrived, on everybody's uh. seat, there was an envelope. Uh -huh. And you were asked, would you put a donation in for a raffle? And I understand that it was going donation to... Donation to who? 
yeah, to Chernobyl, okay. that your, your donation that you put in the envelope was going directly to the Chernobyl Children's Fund. So but they, w- everyone had been told in the ads that your ticket price... Forget about it, Joe. I know I'm... Go ahead.